Hello, good morning. Um, welcome to the Music to Grief to Grief discussion. And we're back with Sharon from Grief Reiki. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning, Andrew. Happy Monday. And happy Monday back at you. We've already been blessed. Hello, Isabelita. Um, amen to you too. Um, so, um, we are going to talk isolation today. Um, and it's something that I've got, you know, the, the, the track of the week refers to this. I mean, I've got experience of it, but I'm going to throw it over to you, Sharon, and just talk about, give us um, yeah, a little overview on, you know, when we talk about isolation and grief, what are we talking about? Well, I think what we're talking about, and it starts when we're really young, about being taught to, you know, remove ourselves from other people when we're going through a tough time. And I was thinking about it and I thought, you know, first of all, you're not supposed to cry in public. You're not supposed to cry as a child because you're removed from that situation. So I can remember my parents saying, going in the, go in the other room if you're going to cry. And then if you think about it, when we're out, I mean, if you're, especially if you're on an airplane or if you're in a restaurant and a child starts to express their sad emotions, what do they do is they remove the child, take them somewhere else, isolate them away. And so I think we've sort of been taught to remove ourselves from situations that are tough and sort of self cocoon and, and um, put ourselves into protection mode and kind of remove ourselves from the rest of the world. And that's how we're supposed to get through things is all by ourselves. Well, I think we know I've tried it. It doesn't work. And um, I think that's just how we've been taught and trained, you know, by observation starting very young as a child. It's, it's again, always, you know, it's super interesting. I love that. Um, I love that reflection because you're right. The, the reality is as a kid, it's like, don't bloody cry. Don't be embarrassed. And it's, it, but it opens up those two things because when I'm down or if I'm dealing with grief, I mean, there are two things at play. One, there's the social conditioning that, you know, you're not to be seen. Mm -hmm. But there's that also, I don't want anybody to see me. There's that, you know, when I'm, and then this, that to me is the dangerous one because I'm, you know, in a bad space and I just, I don't want people to see me. I'm ashamed. There, there, there's a shame element in there and isolation is protective of that. I mean, how does that develop? Well, I think I think you're absolutely right. And I think it goes back to um, our, you know, interacting with people and not wanting to be judged, analyzed or criticized. And so because we grow up seeking approval, again, we've said this, especially here in Los Angeles, you're looking for approval from other people when we have emotions that are difficult we remove ourselves because we don't want anybody to say, you know, what's wrong with you? Why are you acting that way? Or just, you know, get a stiff upper lip or be a real man or all of those kinds of things. And so we remove ourselves and we, we just become conditioned that that's the way that we're supposed to deal with things. And I think, again, it goes back to society and the mixed messages that we get about, you know, expressing ourselves in public. And so I think there's a combination of that, but there's also a combination that it is healthy to to have some sort of isolation, but not to the point of, you know, you're so isolated that you're not interacting with anybody. And so finding a balance between removing ourselves and sort of wrapping ourselves in that loving cocoon and taking care of ourselves, and then also stepping away completely from people to the point where we're totally socially isolated from everybody. You know, it's like finding a balance, which I don't think we've been taught how to do yet. Right, and that's the real challenging bit, isn't it? And I guess that's when you're working as a counsellor. You know, people are, I mean, is that one of the things you deal with? I mean, when was the last time you saw someone? When was the last time you went out? I mean, are these questions that you deal with? Oh, yeah, and absolutely, and especially in groups, because it takes a lot of courage to step out of that cocoon and put yourself into a situation where you're dealing with your emotions, not only with another person, but maybe in a group setting with lots of other people. And so, you know, it's a big deal. And sometimes it takes people quite a while to get to the point where they feel safe and comfortable enough to step out. But I think when they do, they realize that they're not alone in their emotions, that they're not alone with how they're feeling. And it ends up being a positive um, activity for them because then they're validated that, you know, you're not alone, you're not crazy, 
Um, you're going through very similar emotions and reactions that other people have gone through. And I think it takes a lot of the pressure off when you do that because you hear that, you know, you are not the only person in the entire planet is having these kinds of feelings and reactions. And so I think that's very comforting in a lot of ways and helps to push people back out into the real world again. It really, it's that catch 22, isn't it? Because when you're in that space and all you want to do is be alone, be isolated. So nobody sees you, you don't have to deal with anybody. The, the best thing you can do is actually, you know, go to a group session because by its very nature, you're with people, but you don't want to go to the group session because there are people there. How do you help people through that? Well, I think you can't, you know, obviously you can't force anybody to do anything. And I think because everybody's journey is different, everybody's ready at a different point. Um, in their lives to do that. After my friend Joy died by suicide, I mean, I looked up support groups and I never went. I mean, I thought, well, you know, I can do this by myself and, you know, I'm strong and I've got all these you know, superpowers. Was it that you felt that you could do it by yourself or you just didn't want to see other humans? Um, I think part of it was, I mean, for me, it was more that I thought I could do it by myself. Um, that I didn't need any help because we go back to conditioning, right? That, you know, you know, you're supposed to grieve alone. That's the first thing. It's like, you're supposed to grieve alone. You're not supposed to get help. You're supposed to be a good human and you're supposed to be able to do this. And so for me, and that's not true for everybody, but for me, it was like, well, something must be wrong with me if I can't get through it myself. So I didn't go. But then this, after John died, it was like, I need to go and talk about this with a group. And it just, it hit me flat in the face. And I thought, you know what, I am not getting better. And now I have a second suicide to deal with. So I really need to get support from other people. And that whole wall just came tumbling down. And it was the best decision I made because I felt like I was in a place where people respected and honored and I could say words like suicide and other things that, you know, I couldn't say with my regular friends, right. With my family, um, it was a safe space. So I think that's the difference is it's becomes a safe space where you can say how you're feeling with people who get it and who've been there. Um, I think that's the most healing part of it as well. Well, what was it like? Cause do, um, I mean, you find the group and you phone up and you email and it must be nerve wracking as hell walking in there for the first time. Um, I think part of it was very nerve wracking. But the other part of it was I was so tired of feeling the way I was feeling and, you know, doing all of the things that we've talked about in other, you know, videos that don't work, right? You know, keep working really hard and be strong and, you know, grieve alone. And I'm like, this stuff is not working. It's been two years and I do not feel any better. And I think getting to the point where the pain of what you're going through is beyond, you know, what you can handle by yourself and, and just reaching out. And I think just that very first group where I said, hello, you know, I'm Sharon and I've lost to people to suicide and, and be able to say those words, it was like this huge weight was lifted off of my shoulders. So for me, it was just getting to the point of, all right, you know, I, the, the pain is, is worse than it is if I was to go to the group. So I got to just like go to the group. I think that's less painful than continuing the way that I'm feeling. And how long did you, was the group part of your, you know, life? Actually, it even believe it was eight weeks. Um, it continued long after that. We emailed um, the the program that I went to. They actually have ongoing activities and stuff. They have barbecues and whatever. So I mean, it it continued probably just even electronically, maybe for almost another six to eight months afterwards. So that was very healing as well as we kept in touch with each other. And because it was local, I started. It was funny. I started running into people. Um, from the group in different places. And um, that was kind of amazing. We had sort of this unspoken bond. Um, all we needed to do is give each other a hug and say, how you doing? And it's like, yeah, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. So that was very comforting as well. So I'm pretty much, <clears throat> there are grief groups for everything and anything out there, aren't there? 
Yeah, there are. And I think we've also talked about not only in person, but for people who might be geographically isolated and can't get to a group. There's so many virtual groups. And, you know, I, I can't say enough about some of these communities on Facebook that are virtual groups where people can, you know, if nothing else, talk with other people who are going through something, you know, similar to what they're going through and being able to read it and say how you feel and not feel like you're going to be judged. It's just so healing and rewarding. And I think I would recommend if you can't physically get into a group um, and there's all kinds of grief directories out there, like the one that you run, um, you know, you can definitely find a virtual group to join depending on, you know, whatever the topic is, divorce, you know, whatever, and um, talk with other people who are experiencing something very similar, which even though you may be geographically isolated, it, it doesn't, it helps to get you out of the emotional isolation as well. Oh, it doesn't go away, does it? I mean, there's, but it is, it is great that there are so many resources that are now available to people, if we just bloody used them. I mean, that's still the battle, isn't it? And it's still the isolation thing. There's the conditioning is so, certainly for blokes, I guess, um, that there's this, you know, social construct that you should be able to hack it. You know, going to a group is uh, an expression of weakness and, you know, you're a weak man. And and those kind of things are so difficult to, uh, to address. But there are a lot of grief groups specifically for men that I've seen. There's um, one gentleman, Better Not Bitter Widower, his name's John Poole. He, you know, he works with other men who've lost their wives or girlfriends or whatever. Um, There's a whole Facebook page called Grieving Men. And, um, you know, it's really geared for men who, you know, like you said, have been taught all of these things about being strong and, and, you know, not doing certain things. And so they realize that um, this group for men gives men an opportunity to talk with other men, which I think is also very inspiring and healing to know that, you know, you're not alone. And it doesn't have to be in a public place where everybody can see what's going on. It's something that's very confidential and private. You know, I think that's what people want. They want to be able to talk about it, but not, you know, not everywhere, not just in front of everybody, so. Well, if you know somebody, you know, who is isolated at the moment and has taken themselves out, um, is that a good idea? You know, maybe prodding them or letting them know that there are groups Well, I think grievers want to be heard. And so if you're a friend and you have somebody that you know you haven't reached out to in a while, I think that person who's grieving would so appreciate you reaching out and just listening to what they have to say. If it seems like that it's appropriate to suggest, you know, because grievers don't want to be fixed, right? They just want to be heard. So being very sensitive to the fact, um, you know, and maybe just saying, hey, you know, my friend said there's this really cool grief group uh, on Facebook um, you might be interested in. Because as a griever, you're so lost in your grief, sometimes you don't even know where to start. I remember feeling that way. It's like I started Googling because I'm like, grief, you know, what do I do? And so maybe, you know, in a very loving and compassionate way, you can offer up some of these services like these groups or, you know, the Samaritans, um, again, is a great confidential telephone line where you can call and talk to somebody you know maybe you just want to talk and and have somebody hear you you don't necessarily want to join a group so the samaritans you know hotline is another great place to find support and be less isolated just speaking about what you're going through you know kind of brings down those walls it's super interesting well um the track this week for us um is a but a brilliant track. So we were in Dublin um, a couple of weeks ago. And just for luck, um, you know, we'd asked somebody where's where the uh, where's a decent you know music pub and they told us Whelan's. And so we got there and we caught the end of this guy's um set, Kickle Flaherty. And he's got this brilliant um five track EP called The Head and Heart. And he's got these two tracks at the end, and the one that's on the list is Two Hearts, and it's basically you know, the object of his affection is out there on their own. And he's saying, look, come back in, because I'm going to be awesome. And it's <clears throat> it's not typically a sad song, 
but it's one of those songs where you know should the relationship eventually fail <laughs> it's going to be the song that you go back and listen to and listen to as, as you remember what could have been it's like one of those songs that you can fall in love to and fall in love with and it's the soundtrack of your romance because that's that's again one of the things that i wanted to make on the music to groove to list this week is that not all of the songs have to be sad you know the thing about a music to groove to track is that it evokes emotion it makes you feel something it connects you to that and you know i think you and i have spoken about this in the past the you know when i when my first marriage broke up the songs that made me cry were the songs that were the soundtrack of us falling in love and you go back and you revisit them and you have that oh my god i remember this and it's heartache and you you're mourning the loss of what could have been or what was going to be and yet it's still cathartic and it's still useful yeah you're absolutely right and i think you know it, there's nothing that says it all has to be about sad music i think happy mu music can evoke those emotions i mean there's happy tears too so <laughs> Um, happy songs can make you cry. And I think anything that does that is a good thing when you're going through a difficult time in your life. And this is, um, he's a brilliant, brilliant singer. He was, you know, I would say he's better live. I'm not saying he's better live than on the EP, but he's one of those few cats that you actually see live and can sing. You know, it's not, you know, studio production that, that makes him sound you know, better than he actually is. So definitely check him out. Um, what about you? What have you got on for Grief Reiki this week? Um, well, tomorrow is our Facebook Live, and I'll be talking to the person that was uh, instrumental in writing the foreword for my book. She is also a Reiki master and uh, lives in Tennessee and is probably one of the sweetest, kindest, gentlest Southern bells that I have ever met. So I'm looking forward to talking with her tomorrow in person. That's on our Facebook Live page, Grief Reiki page. At what time? Uh, it's at noon, noon um, on Tuesday. Pacific time. I have to think about it. Where am I? Yeah, on noon. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sharon, as ever, thank you very much. Um, you. We will see you next week. Don't forget to check out um, Two Hearts. And um, if you want to learn a little more on the Grief Reiki side, check out Sharon on the Grief Reiki page tomorrow. We'll put a link below. All right. Until next week. Take care, people.